Today, as a one-off, I am deviating from one love to another. In my defence, it's still powered by steam. A few years ago, I was very lucky to visit the Titanic Museum in Northern Ireland, and on the slipways that the Titanic was built on, stand two large glass walls. Etched on the walls are the names of the 1,500 souls lost aboard the Titanic. It struck me just how many names were there, and unless you see it, it's hard to comprehend the numbers. Today, I'm focusing on the story of a very inspirational survivor, how she came to be on the ship, and what it must have been like in the early hours of the 15th of April, 1912. Margaret Tobin was born in the town of Hannibal, Missouri in 1867. Her parents, who were Irish by nationality, had travelled to the Americas to seek opportunity that Ireland couldn't provide. She, like her parents, were devout Catholics. However, unlike some Catholics at the time, they were very open to equality and supported freedom and education, which was highly unusual, especially as some at the time saw education as a waste on girls. Margaret was taught to be self-reliant and to never be satisfied with the hand she was dealt. She was driven to grow and had an active interest in all that was going on around her. After Margaret left school, she worked in a factory. The work was long, dangerous and the pay was low. Margaret remembered what her parents had taught her and strived for something better. So taking her brother, Margaret followed her dreams and moved west. Margaret was one of the few lucky migrants that found a relatively good job in a department store, but others were not so lucky. Many found themselves in the same labour-intensive job as they had before. Worse, gold rush had hit the area, and those seeking their fortunes were forced back to their old professions when the precious metal didn't materialise. Margaret took pity on the workers and helped organise soup kitchens and charity drives. It was at this time that Margaret met the love of her life. J.J. Brown was a local prospector, and although there was a considerable age gap between the two, they were married after just a few short months. Margaret and J.J. moved close to the mines where J.J. was working, and he worked his way through the ranks to become the mine superintendent. When the silver clash of 1893 brought the gold rush to a grinding halt, just as JJ thought he'd lost everything, he found a large gold seam in the mine named Little Johnny. The owners of the mine awarded the Browns with a handsome proportion of shares in their company, and just like that, the couple were millionaires overnight. After purchasing their family home in Denver, the Browns were enjoying the lifestyle that their newfound fortune brought. They had new friends and could live the life of luxury. But Margaret never forgot her roots, and while her friends reveled in their riches, Margaret saw the slums the silver crash had created and the poverty springing up all around her. She wanted change. Luckily, she wasn't the only one and soon joined a group of reformers called the Progressive Movement with a view to improving the city, creating public baths and to make the city more hospitable. She even joined with Ben Lindsay to introduce a new juvenile court system to stop children being tried as adults for any crime that they commit. Her reforms didn't stop there. Controversially, Margaret applied to try to win a seat in the Senate. A woman attempting to win a seat of office was unheard of. Women were not even allowed to vote, let alone sit in a position of power. Margaret's political venture had caused cracks to appear in the marriage and JJ was highly critical of Margaret. But she refused to let gender be a hindrance and she pulled out of the race just one day before the elections. But she proved to all what a woman could achieve and she would remain politically active for much of her life. Margaret and JJ travelled the world and for a time the pair appeared to reconcile their differences. But in 1909 both agreed to separate. JJ gave Margaret the house and money to continue her travels and her reforms. Margaret was free to travel as she pleased and took the opportunity to travel with her daughter and her friends, John Jacob Astor and his wife, Madeline. As Margaret was with the Astors in Paris, word reached her that her grandson was ill, so she booked the first available ship she could find. That ship was Titanic. 
Margaret boarded Titanic from the tender ship Normadic in Cherbourg. The ship was incredibly high-tech and beautifully crafted. She would have been met most likely by several key officers or even Captain Edward J. Smith. Edward was a decorated captain and many dubbed him the millionaire's captain. Titanic was to be his last assignment before he retired and was proud to be given her for the maiden voyage. Mar Margaret's luggage would have been taken to her stateroom and she would have had her own private servants to look after her. Her room would have been decorated with rich gold and ornate wood, then with a private servant quarters and bathroom. There was a gym with the latest machinery, even a mechanical horse. She could have taken a dip in the Turkish baths or even the swimming pool with freshly warm seawater. Meals would consist of the finest ingredients money could buy and some meals lasting up to 13 courses. Margaret could have spent time in the veranda cafes or in the reading or writing rooms. Although there is no evidence today that she did this, Margaret had access to send a telegram to the Americas. She would pay a fee to the ship for the crew to use their Marconi machine to send private messages to the White Star offices in America. From there, it was relayed to the correct correspondent. Finally, Margaret could have just taken in the view and the sea air on the promenade deck. Maybe talk to the Astors as she walked along the ship's length. Or even sat in one of the many deck chairs as she watched the world go by. For the four days Margaret spent at sea, she was happy and content. April 15, 1912, just after midnight, Margaret was reading and was just about to settle down for the night when a crash outside her window threw her off her bed and onto the floor. Confused, Margaret went outside her stateroom and into the hall. She met a man who advised her to put on her life vest. She agreed and went up to the boat deck where the first lifeboats were being prepared. The Titanic's owner, the White Star Line, had previously noted that news reporters were reporting the ship as practically unsinkable. The company had never openly promoted that she was unsinkable, but had never corrected the reporters either. This propaganda had done much to cement people's faith in the ship, and many refused to enter the lifeboats, citing that a ship this new and advanced couldn't possibly be in danger. It was cold, and the prospect of dangling nearly 20 metres above the frigid water in a tiny wooden and unstable craft was not too appealing. Margaret must have realised the situation was dire and so she took a very unusual step and helped others into the lifeboats first. She most likely would have encouraged them to leave the safety of the ship and trust her. Luckily her influence and status may have won many a woman over and many lives were saved thanks to her quick thinking. Margaret may have saved many more had she not herself been picked up and dropped unceremoniously four feet into lifeboat number six. At the helm of the lifeboat was quartermaster Robert Hitchens. He had been at the helm of Titanic when she struck the iceberg and was naturally still shaken up by it. The women begged for an additional oarsman and Major Arthur Godry Pushin was permitted by officer Lightoller to shimmy down the ropes and board the lifeboat. As the boat rowed away, it was less than half full with only 21 people aboard. As the second lifeboat to leave Titanic at first glance, the damage would not have appeared bad. The ship would be listing slightly to her bow, her lights ablaze, with a rocket being fired on occasion, as her pleas for help on the wireless were only being answered by the Carpathia, a full four hours away. Two other ships were closer, however one had no radio, and the others had turned theirs off for the night. Neither knew what the rockets meant, and both thought it was some form of elaborate firework display or a warning about icebergs. Inside the ship, deep within the bowels, the first of the watertight bulkheads would have been overflowing at E-deck. The third class passengers would have been sensing the danger, would have made their way up to the main staircase and onto the boat deck. It's not true that the third class passengers were locked down below as the ship sunk. There were gates but these were used as an immigration tool and a way to segregate the classes. It was reported many times by the few remaining third-class passengers that while the gates existed, 
they were not locked and they were allowed up to the boat deck to try to get one of the remaining lifeboats. As the bow began to sink further in the water, the people in the lifeboats would have heard the music from the band as they continued to play, but an urgency to find a lifeboat would soon be on everyone's mind. Maritime law permitted that for a ship to be certified, they must be outfitted with lifeboats. The rule on the number of boats was dependent on the tonnage of the ship rather than how many souls it carried. Under this law, Titanic actually carried more lifeboats than was deemed necessary. The Titanic had 20 lifeboats aboard, which when the boats were at full capacity, would carry a total of 1,178 people. The ship was mercifully only three quarters full of her full loading capacity of 3,547 passengers and crew. Out of the 18 lifeboats launched, one collapsible failed and one was floated off the ship, many were launched less than half full. Inside lifeboat number six, the mood was tense. Hitchin resented the Major and refused to listen to the Major's request for help with the rowing. Whether the Quartermaster was acting out of fear or feeling his rank was threatened, we will never know. But the men's arguments did little to help with the unfolding horror happening all around them. As more of the ship disappeared into the water, the shouts and scream from those on board must have been horrendous to those in the lifeboats. They would have seen those on board making their way to the back of the ship in a desperate attempt to get away from the rising, freezing water. The ship was sinking faster and faster by the second, and as the ship tilted upwards, they would have seen the propellers rising in the air and tower over them. The lights which have shone through the whole disaster would have finally gone out, as the water shorted the wiring. It was at this time that the breakup of the ship most likely would have occurred. Due to the lack of lights and in the pitch black sky, those in the boats may not have seen the bow break off, and there are several theories of how and when the, life, the breakup took place. Unfortunately, this is something we'll never know for sure. Um, according to some, some survivors thought it was a boiler explosion. While there's little to no evidence this actually happened, the contact of the freezing water against the red-hot metal may have caused the boilers to react. These accounts may also debunk the theory that the ship broke up under the waterline. At the inquiry, the majority of the witnesses called were first-class men and senior crew. They thought the lower classes would be deemed unreliable, but because they never got the full picture, the inquiry led to inaccurate conclusions about the sinking and that she went down intact, a theory that was proved wrong by Robert Ballard when he found Titanic in 1985. As Margaret's eyes focused in the dim light, it's very likely she would have seen the bow bobbing in the ocean before finally slipping beneath the sea. The ship's groaning would have been replaced with the screams and pleas and help from the surviving passengers that the ship had left in the water. Hitchin was urged to turn back by Margaret and several of the survivors. He refused. There's no going back, he said. There's only a lot of stiffs out there. The cries for help were getting fewer as the minutes ticked by. Margaret was furious. She asked the women to grab an oar to keep them warm. Hitchens ordered her to stop, but she ignored him. Seeing his authority undermined, Hitchin continued to protest and he threatened to hit her. Others in the lifeboat soon joined with Margaret and Margaret herself ordered the quartermaster to stand down lest he be pushed overboard. Hitchin continued his tirade but Margaret must have known he was technically right. By now, there was little hope for the passengers in the water. Other than the swearing quartermaster, the sea would have been mostly silent. Margaret directed the ladies two to an oar and worked the oars in shifts. Soon boat six was met up with the survivors of boat 16 and the two were tied together for safety. But it'd be another few hours before both boats would be rescued by the Carpathia. Margaret wasted no time. Her travelling experience had meant she had to learn several different languages. Calling on this experience, she sat and consoled survivors that could speak little to no English and help translate for them. As she travelled around the small ship, she grabbed and distributed blankets to the needy, 
and she also realised that many of the survivors had lost everything, their possessions and some entire families. They literally had nothing. Margaret gathered the first class passengers and before the Carpathia had even made port, she had created the Survivors Committee, was declared chair of that committee and raised over £10,000. Across both sides of the pond, news was breaking that the Titanic had been struck by an iceberg. At first, the news was that she was just damaged and being towed into port, but as more news filtered through, it was established she had gone. The media incorrectly advised that everyone on board was safe, but the White Star Line was quiet. Bruce Ismay, the director of the White Star Line, who had survived the sinking, had locked himself away from the passengers in a separate room and communicated to the company that there was just 705 people aboard Carpathia. When the Carpathia docked, the passengers were whisked away from the crowds to be accounted for. Shortly after, the White Star Line published a list in its offices of the survivors. Thousands gathered to see if their loved ones were on the list. Many were left devastated. The company charted a ship, the Mackie Bennett, to the site of the sinking in an attempt to recover bodies. Some were recovered, John Jacob Astor being one of the found, along with Macy's department store owner, Isidore Strauss, and band member Wallace Hartley, still holding his violin case. They also found the remains of a child. The Ben banded together to give the child a proper burial, calling the little one Our Babe. It took over 80 years to identify the child as Sydney Leslie Goodwin, who was a third class passenger and the only one to be found from his family that were travelling with him. The Mackie Bennett provisioned only for 100 bodies but realised quickly it was not enough. So they prioritised the classes and the bodies in good condition. In all, the ship recovered 119 bodies out of the 306 found. Those that were unable to afford the cost of bringing their loved ones home and the unidentifiable were buried at Fairview Cemetery in Nova Scotia. In Southampton, there wasn't a street within the city that hadn't lost a family member aboard the ship. Families were left destitute when they realised the White Star Line had stopped the crew's wages and support the moment the ship sank and offered no compensation. Margaret strived to help not only the survivors but those directly affected by the disaster. As chair of the committee, she arranged the captain of the Carpathia to receive a large silver cup in commemoration of the ship's valiant efforts and each of the crew received a medal which she personally presented and helped distribute the raised money to the families stricken by the disaster. This also included the families of the crew. The White Star Line did make two further payments to the families. One payment equal to just two weeks wages as a goodwill gesture following a public outcry and a second four years later as compensation following a US civil lawsuit. In today's money, the compensation would equate to just over £430 per lost soul. Margaret was quite vocal in her account of what happened aboard Titanic, and as the press were taken in by her story, she used the fame to push for social reform and eventually chaired an international conference advocating human rights and even ran for office again. She cut her campaign short to work in France to help rebuild the country following the end of World War I. Margaret also took up a career in acting and was not afraid to, afraid to tread the boards in the larger theatres. She was so comfortable on stage, she even took up yodelling, earning her the nickname of the American Warbler. JJ Brown passed away in 1922 and even though they were separated and the fact that JJ openly showed his disdain for her pursuits, Margaret was devastated. She and her children inherited his estate, but thanks to JJ leaving no will, the, the estate's assets caused a bitter rift between Margaret and her children. It took five years to finally reconcile the straining and repair the restraining relationship. Margaret passed away on October 26, 1932, in her sleep at the hotel where she'd been working on her acting career. She was given a simple service and was buried next to J.J. Brown in Long Island. As Margaret was laid to rest, writers began to sensationalise her story. Soon, fictional accounts were written and rewritten, and the unsinkable Molly Brown was born. 
Sadly, some of the stories were cruel to Margaret's memory. They made her to be a social outcast, shunned by the elites due to her outlandish ways, and even some even made out her own family was against her. Even the 1997 film, James Cameron gives Margaret this unfair image, calling her New Money. There is only one scene in the 1997 film that shows Margaret in her true light, and it's a blink and you'll miss it moment. When Jack is invited to dinner, he has no suit, so Molly gives him one to wear. This was typical of the real life Margaret Brown. She knows this man may never be able to repay her, but she gives a very expensive suit to a complete stranger with no questions asked, and it shows her generous spirit and her willingness to help anyone in need. Through the years, Margaret's family, hurt by the media, refused to give any further details of Margaret's personal life or past in case it would be used to tarnish her memory. The actress who played Molly Brown, Kathy Bates, really did try to portray the true Margaret Brown in the best way she could, and in all the characters portrayed in the movie, Molly Brown remains my personal favourite. Margaret's story still continues to fascinate and you can still see it at the home where she and JJ bought. It was renovated in the 50s but has been returned to its original state. It's also a fitting reminder that Margaret lived and died an unsung hero. And I hope on April 15th at 2.20am that you'll all spare a thought and take a moment to remember Margaret and remember all those aboard Titanic and for all those who face peril on the sea.